Hi, I'm Pastor Jimmy, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me for our worship service today. If you happen to have your Bible or a tablet or an i-something, iPod, iPad, iPhone, if you would join me in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, as we find ourselves at the beginning of the Christmas season, you know there's a lot of gift exchanging that's going to happen in the next 30 days. But there is one gift that not only you need to be able to give to others, but it's a gift that you need to be able to give yourself, not just on a daily basis, but several times throughout the day. It's a gift called grace. I want to walk you through just a simple reminder of what grace is and what it looks like in our lives as it flows through us to other people. And so to help us with that, I can't think of a more powerful story about grace than the one we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 7, verse 36, let me share it with you. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to his home for a meal. So Jesus accepted the invitation and he sat down to eat. A certain immoral woman heard he was there and brought a beautiful jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who was the host, saw what was happening and who this woman was, he said to himself, this proves that Jesus is no prophet. If God had really sent him, he would know what kind of woman was touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus spoke up and answered his thoughts. Can you imagine that? Answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. All right, teacher, Simon replied. Go ahead. Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave both of them, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, look at this woman kneeling her here. When I entered your home, you didn't give me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not kiss me in greeting, but she has kissed my feet again and again and again. From the time I first came in, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, they were many. And have been forgiven. She has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. To the men at the table who were sitting there, they began to talk among themselves. Who does this man think he is going around forgiving sins? And Jesus said, the woman, to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Several years ago, I read a book that had a profound impact on me. It's a book that's rated in the top 20 of the 20th century. It was a book written by a man named Philip Yancey. The name of the book, What's So Amazing About Grace? If you haven't read it, I, I really recommend it and encourage, encourage it to you. From the very beginning, when you start reading, it draws you in. It begins with a story, a true story of a woman who is a prostitute. And she's involved in the oldest profession on earth. And this woman is actually a mother. And she figures out if she can recruit her underage daughter into the same work, that she could make more money in one night off of her underage daughter than she personally could make working the whole week. I know what you're thinking. And you're exactly right. What this mother is doing to her daughter was horrible. So one night as the mother and daughter are out soliciting on the streets, right in the middle of their evening, a group of Christians come up. 
And in that moment, they begin to share the love of Jesus Christ with them, of how God really loved them. And he sent his son, his only son, to die on a cross for them. As they shared the good news of, again, how God loved them. And he did this all on the bedrock of grace at the end of their time of sharing or their presentation of the gospel. They looked at this mother and they invited her to come to church and bring her daughter. And I'll never forget what Philip Yancey wrote in his response. He said, church, church, why would I ever go there? They would only make me feel worse than I already do. You know, I believe this story so gripped me because this woman told the church so much that's true about churches and the people that call themselves Christians. So many Christians are horrible stewards of the grace of God. Man, this story gives a visceral response. I found myself almost like a bobblehead, nodding at what this woman was saying. Because throughout my life, growing up in the church as a whole, as a preacher's kid, a PK, I would watch as people would sometimes bring their imperfect alabaster bottles of oil only to be rejected. It wasn't good enough. Their talents weren't polished enough. Or maybe they were a diamond in the rough. You see, they just wanted a chance. They were so excited about Jesus. They wanted a chance to serve. They were, they were on fire for God only to have that fire extinguished by some holy water that somebody would throw on them in Jesus' name. What I grew up seeing was a a great conservatism. It was not a time of grace. And I'm not against conservatism. But it wasn't a time of grace. It was a time of, of law and judgment and condemnation. And you know what? When you grow up in an environment like that, it kills any sense of vulnerability. It literally promotes hypocrisy and shame. Living in secret. There's this sense that I can't be honest. I can't share my real struggles. If I do, I would be disqualified because if I really let you in behind the facade of my smile that I show you on Sunday morning, if you really, really knew what was going on in my life, I fear that I would only be met by rejection and your condemnation and judgment. But what we need to understand is that the bedrock of our faith is not good moral choices. You're not saved because of your virginity. You're not saved because you you go to church every Sunday. You're not saved because of your amazing personal devotion and prayer time. You're not saved because of your tithing record. But, but you are saved by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is God's unmerited favor. I heard a preacher say this. He said, grace means that even if you don't eat all your dinner or your dinner at all, you still get to have dessert. We are saved by grace. And oftentimes, I I think so many Christians have contracted what I call spiritual amnesia because we tend to forget what got us into the kingdom. Grace. It's that thing that, that will keep us in the kingdom. Grace. Grace is what will carry us to home, to heaven someday, to see our maker. It all begins and ends and is sustained by grace. The great writer C.S. Lewis was one time asked what the difference between Christianity and other world religions, what it was. And without even thinking about it, he just simply said, it's grace. Never get so sophisticated or so grown up or so big. Never get so educated in your Christianity that you stop marveling And being in awe of the fact that you and I are horrible sinners. And it's only through the grace of a holy God. Why is it so hard for us? Why is it so hard for us to to receive what grace? Why is it so hard for us to give grace? The reason I believe it's so hard is because you and I are being discipled in a culture that is steeped with something called meritocracy. Now, I'm not giving you just a big fancy word. In fact, I want you to say that word with me today, meritocracy. 
Meritocracy simply means my identity is found in my performance. Meritocracy means that my self-esteem and my self-worth is not found in the cross of Jesus Christ and the one that died for me, but it's found in my moral striving and my performance. I see it a lot in sports. And now I'm not against sports. I'm not being negative. In fact, I've even discussed this with some former pro players, both football and baseball, and they agree from the time they were little, their self-worth or how good they were was found on stat sheets. That your self-worth was found on how many tackles and sacks you made, how many yards you rushed. Or in baseball, the number of no hitters you had or, or, or your RBI or your ERAs or, or your home, home runs. And when you get enough of these, you can get recruited to a college with a scholarship. And if you keep doing those things, you might even get drafted by the pros. And if you get drafted by the pros and you continue to perform well, then you might end up right down the road here in a place called Canton, Ohio, the, the Hall of Fame, the Football Hall of Fame. Perform, perform, perform. You see, this is meritocracy. The reason I mentioned this word meritocracy, and I had you say it, is because it's just not for athletes, it's for all of us. We see it in education, in GPAs. You, you get a good GPA so you can get into the right college and have the best opportunity. Now again, there's nothing wrong with good grades. I'm, I'm not saying that. Then we do the same in college so that we can get the awesome job. And then we get the great job and we continue on this performance wheel and if we don't perform well, then somebody else will take our job. Yet in the middle of all of this stands the kingdom of God where Jesus stands and he shakes his fist daily at meritocracy. And he says, you are not where you live. You are not your GPA. You are not your amount of money in the bank. You are not the corner office with the view. You are a sinner that has been saved by grace. But what does that look like? What does that look like really to walk in grace and to really give grace to others? What does it look like as a church to be an environment in our community where people who have really messed up big time and have failed terribly, can come like the woman did to Jesus that day and sit at his feet without any sense of judgment or condemnation. What does that look like for, for people like that? Not, not to just come here, but how about to come to your dinner table? If you want to be like Jesus, what does that look like? In Luke chapter 7, in verse 34, Jesus is in the town called Nain. And Jesus lets it slip what his reputation is. He says, here's what I'm known for. I'm known for being a friend of sinners. My reputation, Jesus says, is I'm known for hanging out with people who've made a mess of their lives. Maybe that's you today. On the inside, maybe right now, you're saying, amen, preacher. I've made a mess of my life. I've made wrong choices. I've done things wrong. I've even hurt some people along the way. And I want you to know you're exactly the kind of person that Jesus wants to hang with today. Jesus says early in Luke 5, I have not come for the healthy, but I've come for the sick. I've come because... I'm a man of grace. In this story in the town of Nain, he's invited by a man named Simon, the Pharisee. He's invited this great teacher, this rabbi, Jesus, Simon has to his house. I want to encourage us not to be so quick to make a villain out of Simon. I believe the story unfolds. Simon has quite a lot going on in his mind. Simon is looking at Jesus, and I believe in his heart, Simon has some good intentions. You see, he didn't invite Jesus over to start an argument with him. 
He actually thinks that Jesus is a teacher, a rabbi, and he addresses him that way. You see, it's a title of honor. In fact, we are under the impression that Simon views Jesus as a prophet. And, and then we have this woman who shows up and in the scripture, he refers to her as a sinner. We don't know her name, no first name. We only know that she's a sinner. This is the description of her being a sinner. She's a woman of the night. She is, she is like the woman that I talked about earlier in my message from Philip Yancey's book. This woman that comes to Simon's house, she is part of the oldest profession in the world. At this time in history, many women that were in this profession had been married and divorced. You see, back then, a woman could not divorce her husband. So it was the man who held all the cards. You see, the man back then could divorce their wife and it would happen rather quickly. So there would be no alimony or child support. So the only way a woman could make it in that time was to put herself in a position to make money in a professional way. So here's this woman. She's been mistreated by men and she's forced to deal with men on a daily basis in a way that is demeaning. And yet everything about our text tells us that, that this is her second encounter with Jesus. She comes in, she falls to the floor, she's crying, she's weeping. Everything about the way she's acting around Jesus, she's saying thank you, thank you, thank you, which points us to the fact that they had met before. And all she could do is say thank you, but the way she is saying thank you was culturally inappropriate. She was wiping his feet with her hair, which would have meant that she would have had to loosen her hair. She would have had to let it down. Back in first century, women never wore their hair down in public. It was sensual. It was a suggestive act for a woman to do that. And then on top of that, she is kissing and rubbing and anointing his feet. But then again, that would have been looked at as a very sensual and provocative act. Everything this woman was saying loudly was that she'd never been around preachers before. She'd never been around the church before. She didn't get the memo about how she was supposed to act. She was just totally lost in the presence of Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been so lost or moved by Jesus in a moment that you didn't act proper. You weren't even thinking about that in the moment of your response. It was a holy moment. You were just kind of lost control. And in your own way in that moment, you just were wanting to thank Jesus. Maybe you raised your hand or you fell on the floor and just w was weeping. Jesus was sitting there eating and Simon has kind of given him a side glance. It's an uncomfortable moment. In fact, Jesus is so comfortable, that's what's bothering them. He seems to be comfortable about this woman. She, he's not embarrassed. He's not shooing her away. Jesus welcomed this woman in a very loving way. He was very careful how he handled her baggage of the past. It was grace. You know how I know we're stewarding well? Is that we attract people who maybe are less than. Maybe people who feel comfortable that they don't have to keep secrets. You attract people that can just open up and share about themselves because you are welcoming them. You're not approving what they do maybe, but you accept them. You can see their heart. And so you are careful how you handle the baggage of their past. It's grace. How, how do you handle people's baggage? I heard a story one time of a, of a man that was an executive and his son was going somewhere and he said, uh, hey dad, can I borrow your bags? Because this man, because he traveled a lot, he had some pretty expensive luggage. And he said, sure. In that moment, I guess the wife looked over and thought he was kind of crazy that, you know, she said, are you okay? You feeling okay? You're gonna let your son use that expensive luggage? He says, sure, why not? The son packed his luggage and was 
going out to put it in the car. And the dad stood and looked out the window and he saw as his son left the house, his son just throws this luggage into his car. The dad flew out the door and he said, hold it, hold it, hold it, stop. Oh, no, 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 no. I want my luggage back. I want my baggage back. The dad said, come walk in the house. We'll find you something to put your stuff in. Now, why did the dad take his luggage back? Obviously, because he didn't like the way his son was handling it. Where are you going with this, Pastor Jimmy, talking about luggage and baggage? Here it is. I'm convinced the reason we are not seeing people with tons of baggage come to the church, the place that's supposed to be a hospital, a place that's supposed to be a place of healing is because they have come in contact with some Christians who have failed in how they handled their baggage. They did not use grace. They, they just threw it around. They, they, they weren't encouraging. They, 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 they weren't caring how they handled other people's baggage. They handled it with judgment and disregard. The apostle Peter said this, love covers a multitude of sin. Judgment and self-righteousness exposes itself, but grace covers it. Jesus says to this woman, your sins are not your issue. It's not your dysfunctions, but I want you to know your sin is forgiven. Did you notice how Jesus covered that moment? Can I ask you today, who are some of the people that you're covering with grace? Or, or is it easier to gossip and slander? Is it easy to be careless with the baggage of their life and their past? When John saw Jesus, remember he said this, here's a man full of grace and truth. I love that order. John says, when he saw Jesus, I saw a man full of grace and truth. Oftentimes people will not hear truth until they first feel grace. You know, a lot of times we live our days pointing out other people's problems, don't we? Instead of having him for a meal at our table, stewarding grace well. We've all forgotten how we've messed up and sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it's been the grace of God that has covered our sin. Simon the Pharisee, the word Pharisee means separated one. These were self-righteous, arrogant, narcissistic people who based their inflated views off the failures of others. They were constantly measuring people. Simon needs people like this woman around him to justify his existence. He's happy she's messed up. So here's Simon, the Pharisee. He's the separated one. And he's thinking, Jesus, how can you let this woman touch you and act this way? Don't you know what kind of low life person she is? Jesus said, let me deal with that, Simon. Jesus says to Simon, listen, Simon. You need to understand, as a host, you had two jobs to do tonight. Number one, you're the host, I'm the guest, which means when I came into your house, you should have greeted me with a kiss. Not only did you not kiss me, and that was a Jewish custom, by the way, but this woman, Simon, from the time she has been in my presence, she continued to kiss me. The second job you had as the host was to you were to make sure that I, your guest, had my feet washed. Again, that was a custom of the time. You didn't do that, Simon, but this woman has not stopped washing my feet. In other words, Simon, while you're sitting there high and mighty, not only have you failed, but this person has done your job. And not only has she done your job, she has gone above and beyond. By the way, that's one of the ways that you know that you have encountered grace. You know you've encountered grace because grace is never satisfied with the bare minimum. Grace always wants to go above and beyond. Grace isn't satisfied with just a tithe. 
It gives more. Grace isn't just satisfied with just coming to church. It wants to do more. That's what happens when you really have a fresh encounter with grace. So Jesus says, Simon, let me tell you a story. And he tells him about the two people that owed a different amounts of money. But please notice that neither of them could pay it back. So Simon, you're so self-righteous looking down on this woman, but I want you to understand something. Yes, you have a little more church time and a little more Sunday school time than she has. But when it comes to the light of eternity, both of you have failed. How do you know you're stewarding God's grace well? Is when it welcomes sinners and it it offends the self-righteous. Grace offends the self-righteous. Some of you are, 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 are doing great damage to the kingdom. You know why? Because a lot of us are are so high and mighty. We're not good at receiving help from other people. We think, I I, I give help. I, I don't need your help. Listen, the real truth is we all need help. But there are those that are offended by that. Why are they offended? Because that's what grace does. It often offends I've come to remind you today that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We are not saved because we haven't done drugs, smoked weed. We're not saved because we have never had an addiction. We are not saved because we've never stole something. We are not saved because we're a good and obedient child and we never gave our parents any problems. We are not saved because we have never done this and never done that. Listen, just because you grew up in never, never land most of your life does not make you saved. You are saved because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, then stop looking down in judgment on other people. You and I are no different or better than the crack addict that's under a bridge today in Pittsburgh that's shaking as he's trying to heat up his crack pipe for a morning hit. My concern is that there are three types of people listening to me right now. There is a woman who's the sinner. There's Simon, the selfish, righteous person. And then there are those that are lying, saying, I'm not either one. There are some of us that has sense enough to know that we've messed up, that that we are blind. And sometimes we can't see the mess we're in. Some of us are self-righteous and and, and we stink and we smell, but we don't think we are. Listen, self-righteousness will ruin relationships with your kids and your friends and your family. It'll ruin relationships because nobody wants to be around an arrogant person that everybody else stinks but them. I was thinking about when I went to college, my parents made arrangements that whatever I needed, my meals, my books, my money, money to wash my clothes, whatever I occurred in my name, they covered. You see, I could rest easy because I wouldn't get the bill because they had covered it. That's what grace is. When we sin, we sin in our name. Every sin we have ever committed and we will ever commit in our name. But Jesus says, you'll never get the bill because your bill is paid in full. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Would you bow your heads with me right now as I close? I know there are some of you today that you're going through a lot of guilt and shame. You know what it's like to have made a mess out of your life. You you know what it feels like to have failed. Please hear me right now. God has more mercy than your mess. There is no statute of limitations on his grace It's so true what Paul said to the Ephesians, God is rich in mercy. 
Today, his grace and mercy is for you. It's his gift to you if you receive it. This could be the greatest Christmas gift if only you will receive his forgiveness and his grace. Let's pray. We come before you today. In my mind, I keep hearing those words of that song, grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. If we don't know you today, Lord, I pray that everyone watching will say, yes, Jesus, I accept you as my gift. I ask you to come into my heart and life, and I ask you to forgive me of every sin, everything I've done or said, everything intended or things that I didn't even know that I have done. I want to be right. I want to be clean. I want to be forgiven. Father, I pray for every Christian that's walking, watching today that would say, you know what? I've been that way. I've kind of find myself on the upper crust of things because I've been a Christian a while. I've walked with the Lord a while. I know a few scriptures. Help us not forget that we were once lost and we were found. As I've often heard it said, Lord, help us not work in the bakery so long that we lose the taste for the bread. Father, help us to be what you've called us to be gently hanging, handling the bags of people's lives and their past, being willing to reach out in love and not condemn, condemnation, to realize that even though our sin may have been different, we have all sinned and been in the same shape, lost and short of the glory of God. Father, I pray for this Christmas season that we would know the joy and the love and forgiveness for those that struggle, they may find the peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. Bless us this day. Forgive us. And if we have the light of Christ, may we clean the windows of our lives that you would shine even brighter in the darkest night that anyone out on the tempest seas could see the light of safety that would bring them home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for joining us on this first Sunday of Advent. I look forward to seeing you again soon.